It's here, ladies and gentlemen, the beautiful, the powerful, the all new Home Pod Mini. Okay, look, I know. Hold your horses. We'll get to the exciting stuff in a minute. But Apple just concluded its annual iPhone keynote. Damn, the iPhone boring. Let's get to the Home Pod. Now, so this event typically happens in September. And this year, it was a little late because of, well, COVID 19. There are a lot of changes to these iPhones, both visually and internally. Now, there were some omissions in certain categories, some surprises in other areas, and I have a lot of thoughts. So let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Setup. It's like Netflix, but for Mac apps, including some of my favorite desktop programs for just $9.99 per month. Sign up today with my link below. Apple started the keynote with the long rumored release of HomePod Mini. Now, despite its grand unveiling a couple years ago, I don't think HomePod ever took off quite like Apple had expected or hoped. Uh, for one, its ostentatious launch price of $350 made it a huge barrier to entry for many people. And while the sound quality was nice, perhaps even impressive for a device of its size, it just didn't come anywhere near close in performance to more classic stereo systems in the same price bracket. And the limitations of Siri and its supported services made it a non-starter for basically everyone but the Apple devout. HomePod has since dropped in price uh, to about $300, with sales frequently offering it as low as $199. And thanks to the increasing adoption of HomeKit by smart home devices and the rise of domestic market share of Apple Music, sales of HomePod have increased, but not much. Now, while Apple doesn't disclose individual unit sales anymore, most analysts suggest that they've sold fewer than 5 million devices since launch over two years ago. Now, by comparison, Amazon is reported to have sold over 40 million Echo devices in 2019 alone. And thus, the HomePod Mini is born. It has the exact same feature set of the original HomePod, but it comes in a much smaller size, with a much smaller price, and a single driver speaker design. However, the capabilities of that speaker are boasted by two passive radiators and what Apple calls an acoustic waveguide. Now look, this thing is not going to sound amazing. It might be pretty good given its size, however Apple can't out-engineer physics. It's not going to sound fantastic. B but that's the thing, it doesn't have to. All they have to do is beat the Amazon Echo. And I think Apple's audio engineering prowess is impressive, and it's not unreasonable to think that the HomePod Mini will sound better than the new Amazon Echo, which looks very visually similar. <laughs> Classic Apple, copying Amazon's timeless designs. Apple also buckled down and announced the addition of third-party streaming service support with Pandora, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio supported at launch. Spotify is notably missing from the list, but Apple said that others will be announced later this year, and so one has to assume and hope that negotiation is in process, but just not yet completed on the Spotify side. Last, the device adds support for Apple's Proximity U1 chip that we've seen in many of their recent devices. And this will allegedly enable awesome handoff and interaction features. Uh, something that the original HomePod already does much better than the majority of other smart speakers, but it's still a far cry from mastering. This should help bridge the gap. At $99, I honestly think it's pretty competitive, and Apple is going to sell a lot of these things. Something the original HomePod could really have only dreamed of. The headline and announcement at this event, however, and of course, was the iPhone. So why are we talking about the HomePod? Let's get into it because there is a lot to unpack. Apple announced four new phones today, the most they've ever announced in a single keynote ever. Starting at $700, we have the iPhone 12 mini, followed by the $800 iPhone 12, and then there's our typical gap where we have a couple hundred dollars in between with the 12 Pro and the 12 Pro Max on the high end, each making their typical appearance at $1,000 and $1,100 respectively. Now, all four models rock a brand new design and form factor. Uh, kinda. It actually harkens back to the days of yore, because everybody knows that the sexiest iPhone of all time, it's the iPhone 4. Look, I don't make the rules, it just is. And the new iPhone 12 looks like its brawnier, more sophisticated offspring, with flat glass on the front and the back, with aluminum sides, or stainless steel on the Pro models. Uh, we also have the familiar antenna lines that we remember from the olden days. And uh, well, did anyone else find it a little funny, uh, hilariously ironic in fact, that they talked about how amazing 5G performance was with the iPhone 12's antenna system, while inside of the very same anechoic chamber that we last saw a decade ago when the iPhone 4 launched with the antenna gate scandal? <laughs> no? Okay. Anyway, speaking of 5G, 
5G, wow! This was clearly Apple's big pitch for the new phones, which I found a bit unusual because 5G is largely useless in most parts of the world. That said, it's a very buzzwordy and hot thing right now, making it excellent from a marketing perspective. Now, all of the new phones will have 5G and 5G millimeter wave support, which is awesome for all 12 of you that can benefit from that. <laughs> now, to save battery, Apple has implemented what they call smart data mode. And this is clever because every kind of transition we've had from 2G to 3G and 3G to LTE, there is a huge hit in the battery department. This is supposed to fix that. When 5G can't actually be utilized, it falls back to the LTE modem during normal use. And then when you actually need to make use of those 5G speeds, if you're in a 5G coverage area, only then will 5G re-enable itself. This is pretty clever. They talked about a bunch of numbers during the keynote, including a ridiculous 3.5 gigabits of throughput. However, your real world usage will vary drastically from those best case scenarios. Besides, I don't wanna sound like a 5G hater and off the hype train, but I have 5G on my Galaxy Fold 2 and I literally couldn't care less. Yes, speeds are frequently faster than LTE, but they're also frequently not. And good LTE results in like throughputs of over 350 megabits per second for me. There are so few scenarios where I could even make use of the existing bandwidth we already have on mobile devices, which makes it basically meaningless. The one area where I can imagine maybe benefiting from 5G is low latency multiplayer mobile gaming on the go. But that's a really small number of people who actually care about that. If you're interested, I recently did a video about how you can even make practical use out of high bandwidth and the limitations that come from being able to download data faster than basically anybody can serve it to you. Check that video out by clicking here. Side note, the constant tie-ins throughout the keynote with Verizon Wireless were gross and felt very un-Apple-like. Also, I made fun of Apple and Verizon on Twitter about it and the official Verizon account retweeted it. <laughs> Morons. So we've got 5G, but we've also got the new A14 Bionic on all models, which is a six core CPU, four core GPU beast. Now, interestingly, they did not compare the A14 Bionic to the A13 Bionic, instead comparing it to existing mobile chips from Qualcomm, calling the A14 the fastest SOC on the market. And look, we have no reason to doubt them. It frequently is the truth. However, it was a little surprising because they love to brag about how much faster their new chip is over their old chip they had released the year prior. And this year, they didn't, likely because the A14 Bionic just is not as large of a jump in performance as usual. Kind of disappointing. All iPhone models will also be getting the new MagSafe for iPhone, which I am really excited about. I think this is a classic Apple thing where Android fanboys are gonna make fun of it and say that's stupid, but then it's gonna actually end up being a huge quality of life improvement. Around the Qi charging coil inside all four of the phones is a circle of neodymium magnets. The most obvious and likely use case is the surprisingly reasonably priced a $39 puck that will snap onto the back of your iPhone and supply 15 watts of wireless charging power. It has long been rumored that Apple was going to kill the lightning port in favor of straight Qi charging. And to me, <laughs> it never made sense. It especially didn't make sense when leakers started saying that they would be omitting the lightning port in favor of a magnetic port on the side of your phone where you could attach a weird charger off the... But that doesn't make any sense. How's that any different than a lightning port other than it's less stably attached and so you bump it and it gets disconnected. Uh, people who had MagSafe MacBooks, rest in peace MagSafe. I love you and I hope you come back. Well. I mean, I guess it's coming back now because it exists for the iPhone, but you know what I mean. People who had those, especially the second generation skinny MagSafe charger, know that they were frequently interrupted and disrupted by even the slightest movements in the cable. Not good. This new MagSafe solution is way better because it just puts a bunch of really powerful magnets on the back of the phone and it slaps on. It actually makes sense. And while we have our lightning ports still this year, I won't be surprised that if in the future, maybe even as soon as next year, that space is omitted to make room for a larger battery or better speakers or a new sensor of some sort. But that MagSafe port has other uses too. The magnets are useful for, well, attaching crap to the back of your phone. All of Apple's new cases will magnetically attach in this same fashion and also pass through Qi power, obviously, so you can still charge. But they also announced a cool magnetic wallet case. Unfortunately, for $60, ouch. 
and a duo charger, which is really cool. It folds up into this handy little travel size case, but will charge both your iPhone and your Apple Watch. Very neat and probably very expensive. They didn't release a price and I think it's because it's gonna be a lot of money. This is clearly the, hey, so air power didn't really work out and here's our new solution alternative. And honestly, I'm all about it. This seems way better than air power. Better yet, third party accessories will be able to make, um, you know, this even cooler. Apple showed off Belkin's fancy charging accessories, including a magnetic car mount, which is pretty cool. And uh, well, this weird fancy charging dock thing. Also, as Dieter Bone pointed out, uh, Palm Pre did magnetic wireless charging first. <laughs> Respect Palm, okay? Why did we have to lose such a perfect vessel? Rest in peace, Palm. They also took the stage announcing their new ceramic shield glass that they've allegedly co-developed with Corning. It uses little tiny ceramic crystals that are embedded inside the glass, which allegedly strengthen the display without impacting optical clarity. Now, there's no word yet whether or not this is an exclusive to Apple. I'm guessing that it isn't, and is actually an upcoming version of Gorilla Glass that Apple just happens to get first. But they do state that they are the first to have it of any smartphone, and that it's, quote, up to four times tougher than any smartphone glass before it. I'm frankly more interested to see its scratch resistance. Both from primary and anecdotal evidence, my friends and I have noticed in recent years that while smartphone glass has gotten uh, more resistant to drops and to bumps, it comes at the expense of hardness. Especially with my iPhone 11, most of my recent phones just scratch like crazy. They don't break anymore, but they scratch. Uh, ceramic is strong. Uh, whether or not that crystalline structure uh, will actually increase surface hardness remains to be seen, but I would love to have a display with glass that scratches at a level seven with deeper grooves at a level eight. And that's where the similarities end. So. Let's talk about the differences. The 5.4 inch iPhone 12 mini, which I am so unreasonably excited about guys. Look, I'm pretty tall, I'm six foot four, and I've got pretty big hands, but I love small phones. And I haven't seen a flagship phone this powerful and this small since, I'm not kidding, probably 2015. So I'm freaking stoked and I'm getting pretty distracted. So where, um, where are we? The iPhone 12 mini, and the larger 6.1 inch iPhone 12, which has the same display size as the iPhone 11, but is smaller in every dimension, nice, share their features between one another, right? So they're the same. The biggest update is that these are both OLED displays. Forever gone is the LCD from Apple's modern phone lineup. In my opinion, this is fantastic. And these OLED screens come in higher resolutions too. The iPhone 12 mini has a 1080p screen, and the iPhone 12 has a slightly higher resolution, though slightly less pixel dense, 1770p resolution. A nice jump from the prior iPhones to be sure. But the subpixel arrangement on uh, OLEDs is a little different than LCDs. And so the difference is gonna be less noticeable than you'd think, but they're gonna look good. They're Apple displays. Well, they're Samsung displays, but Apple picks them. <laughs> they're both HDR, they're both True Tone capable, and they both have P3 color support with 625 nits max brightness for standard def content and 1200 nits max brightness when displaying HDR content. This is fantastic. They are very bright. They both have the same two camera uh, system, which is not dissimilar from the iPhone 11. In fact, it seems basically the same. The main shooter seems largely unchanged, but the ultra wide camera has a slightly more open lens assembly. The sensor, uh, based on what I've heard is the same, but it will have slightly better low light performance because the lens assembly is a little different and it's supposed to bring like 27% more uh, light into the lens but not a huge deal. The ultra wide has never been a very good camera. Improvements are there, but they're probably not gonna be substantial. Hopefully they're better than nothing. But most notably, both devices offer the very popular night mode. Excitingly, not just on the rear shooter, but also on the front facing camera too. This is fantastic. Smart HDR and portrait mode have alleged improvements as well, but they tend to get these year over year. And you can now record your video in 4K HDR with Dolby Vision. The likelihood of you noticing a difference or being able to even play back on any other device <laughs> is pretty low, but sure, it's cool. And that's about it. I think in the camera department on these lower end phones, we're not gonna notice a massive jump, uh, at least not unless there are some big improvements in software because the hardware, it's largely the same. Oh, and you don't get headphones or a charger in the box. You're welcome. <laughs> Hope you have a USB-C brick laying around because that's what the phone ships with, USB-C to lightning. 
which is a little surprising. I would have thought they would have shipped within the USB-A cable because everyone has a USB-A power brick, but yeah, okay. iPhone 12 Pro and iPhone 12 Pro Max. I'm really happy to report that the improvements here over the standard iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 mini are really minor. And honestly, I have to commend Apple for not crippling their smaller sized and lower priced phones with crappier specs like most Android OEMs do. They just leave out a couple of the high-end features. Uh, what features are they? <laughs> They're really minor and honestly kind of dumb in my opinion. The major improvement visually on the exterior is the move from aluminum to stainless steel. Now the stainless steel is polished and it's very pretty looking, but I don't find that the visual improvements are worth the much heavier weight that comes with the stainless steel. And I actually prefer the feeling of the cheaper aluminum iPhones for this reason. Oh, and then you get a LiDAR sensor. Yeah, okay, whatever. I have it on my iPad Pro and I have noticed very little improvement over the standard kind of AR integration on most iPhones. And while AR can be cool, I mean, I used an app to create a floor plan for my new house. Uh, the LiDAR sensor, you know, it, it worked, but it was still way too unreliable and it shifted objects I had placed around the room. And ultimately I had to just measure stuff manually in the app. So meh, okay. Now we get to cameras and this is where things get confusing. The standard iPhone 12 Pro, okay, the $1,000 phone, it adds a 52 millimeter equivalent 2X telephoto lens that we're used to. And based on the specs page, it seems pretty much unchanged from last year. So in short, it's the exact same camera system as the iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 mini, but with LiDAR autofocus and last year's old telephoto lens. There are some changes in software. Apple has allowed this phone to shoot the Apple Pro RAW format, uh, basically just RAW for your phone. It, it provides a little more flexibility in editing photos in post. Cool. And then they also allow for 60 FPS Dolby Vision video recording. Uh, the iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 mini are capped at 30 FPS video recording for Dolby Vision. But these are artificial software lockouts. I mean, these phones have the same camera system, basically, and they have the same SOC. So there's no reason that that shouldn't be available across the line, but it's not. It's a software lockout, whatever. These are not that big of a deal. Okay, so that's iPhone 12 Pro. Now let's talk about iPhone 12 Max because this is where it gets weird. iPhone 12 Pro Max actually does have a number of camera hardware upgrades, but suspiciously, they rolled over this very quickly in the keynote and the comparison specs page makes it intentionally difficult to understand the differences in camera systems, uh, not really conforming to the regular column layout they're using. I don't think they want you to know that the iPhone 12 Pro Max has a much better camera system than the iPhone 12 Pro with only a hundred dollars price difference. But the iPhone 12 Pro Max, presumably because of the size, ditches the old telephoto cameras in favor of a slightly slower, but much tighter 65 millimeter equivalent 2.5 optical zoom camera. Basically, more zoom. Additionally, the standard 1X wide camera, the main camera, the primary shooter, seems to get some fairly substantial hardware upgrades. It has a new faster lens assembly and a new 47% larger sensor, which results in an 87% improvement in low light over the standard iPhone 12 Pro, according to Apple. Well, that's a freaking lot. <laughs> it also has what Apple dubs as sensor shift technology. So instead of the lens assembly moving in an optically stabilized kind of image, it moves the sensor itself, which can be done far more quickly, resulting in superior OIS performance. Now, jury is still out on whether or not these hardware updates are actually going to make a difference, but it does put the standard iPhone 12 Pro in a very weird spot because it costs $200 more than the iPhone 12. And the only improvements, literally the only improvements are a stainless steel build quality, LiDAR, last year's meh telephoto lens, and Apple Pro RAW. That's it, $200 for that. There were some disappointments today, at least for me. But let me first disappoint you with an ad. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because today's sponsor setup is fantastic and I have been a paying subscriber for years, long before they ever decided to sponsor the channel. Basically setup is a subscription service to the best Mac apps and now the best iOS apps too. For as little as $9.99 per month, you can get access to applications like iStat Menus, which shows your system's health and other utilities like a network widget. I use this thing freaking all the time, right from the Mac OS menu bar. There's also Forecast Bar, which is like Dark Sky, but for the Mac, providing amazing uh, weather updates, including down-to-the-minute rain warnings. You've got 
Clean My Mac X, one of the most famous and highly regarded utilities for managing your file system and helping keep your Mac tidy. These are just a few of the fantastic Mac apps available, and several more are available for iOS for just $2.49 a month. Like Ulysses, the app in which I wrote this script that you're hearing now. Sign up today with my link in the video description, and we thank Setup for supporting our iPhone Day coverage. Okay, disappointments. Well, one of them was the lack of 120 hertz, which had been rumored for a very long time. Now, I know a lot of Apple defenders will rush to say that this is not a feature that normal people care about, but I'm sorry, I disagree. Especially when those people, I love you boys, by the way, are talking about Dolby Vision being a huge selling point. Literally no normal person cares about Dolby Vision. They don't even freaking know what HDR is. While only us tech nerds actually know what 120 hertz is, normal people feel that something is different. Even if they can't articulate what it actually is, the phone feels more fluid and it feels faster. A high frame rate display makes a much bigger difference in perceivable speed than a processor jump from generation to generation. It really does. Everyone who uses my iPad Pro has commented on how quick it feels, and that comes down to the 120 hertz display. I've been using 120 hertz on my iPad Pro, on my Galaxy Z Fold 2, and going back to 60 hertz friggin' sucks, okay? Trust me, I know that this was rumored to be on Apple's plan and supply chain issues probably prevented it from happening this year, but I'm still really bummed. I feel like we should have it, Apple should have it on these flagship devices. I would have vastly preferred it over 5G, even though I know 5G is technically better for marketing. But seriously, they're advertising Dolby Vision like anybody gives a crap about that. Additionally, phones in my opinion, uh, these phones, they're a little on the pricey side. iPhone 11 launched at $699, and iPhone 12, the same size, is now $799, and that comes without a charger or headphones. Now, that said, every phone does have 5G, uh, every phone is been, has been redesigned with MagSafe and OLED displays, and so I get why they're a little more expensive, and they're still gonna sell outrageously well, but it's a little bit of a bummer. I'm gonna be buying an iPhone 12 mini and iPhone 12 Pro Max, so be sure to get subscribed and enable notifications so you can see my review when it goes live. Let me know, are you picking up new iPhones? If so, which? Leave your comment down below, and I'll respond to as many as I can. But thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.